Start a meeting when our illustrious chair is not here yet. So approved. Consent items. Do we want to pull anything from the consent calendar? Moving on to 4A, general business resolution for a specialty court park program. Okay. Um, uh, I'll defer to the mayor. Let me, let me talk to you about um, 4A and 4B together because they really do go together. And uh, Councilmember Sunberg worked on this uh, as well as Judge Day. Uh, um, so, so, what we have is really two. So the trespass ordinance will not go into effect until we can stand up the court. And um, uh, when I, I wrote the initial trespass uh, ordinance, I don't know, I think it was in 2020, 2021 maybe. And uh, the way it was written was that, uh, with the exception, obviously, private property, that's a separate trespass issue. There are special areas in the, in the city uh, such as uh, riparian areas or park areas uh, that, that is considered trespass where there's no camping. But outside of that, for the rest of the city, um, it was 72 hours notice. Uh, and and um, and then they, they simply had to move. Um, and so um, we are, we have large teams that, that go out every week, uh, make contact uh, in the encampments. Uh, good morning, Madam Chairman. Uh, that that uh, make contact with all these services, and unfortunately, very rarely uh, are those services taken up. Um, and so, uh, in terms of a place to stay and services, and so this is this is a pr approach that will be more aggressive on um, on the um, payment side, but more aggressive on the services side at the same time. And so. Uh, the, the the trespass ordinance will be that in an area designated by the, the city, which is in, in this the I-225 corridor, that that it will simply be no camping, and that a violation of that is well will be considered trespass uh, with a court date and a, and, a, and a potential fine. The goal is uh, not to punish. The goal is to for them to receive treatment, and so. Uh, that's why the, the truck pass ordinance will not be in effect until we stand up the court. And so uh, Judge Day uh, and, and Councilmember Sumberg and I um, and Councilmember Gardner is on this. Um, but we looked at a number of what we call problem solving courts throughout the Denver Metro area. Uh, I went to Denver first and then uh, Judge Day and I and Councilmember Sumberg and just Foster and Emma Knight and crew uh, went over to um, I think we went to Arvada and we went to Lakewood. Uh, I know uh, Judge Day and I, I think Council Rose, were also on um, uh, virtually watched proceedings in Boulder and Fort Collins. Uh, and, and so these problem solving courts, what the and we have some already in the city that are specialized in different. We have one for veterans. I think we have one for veterans. But those would be specialized for individuals experiencing homelessness. And so uh, the you know the way it will work, and I will defer to Judge Day, but they would be given probation and in exchange for probation. The, they would there would be uh, court order to do certain affirmative things to change their behavior. Um, we I, I believe that we would have to prioritize uh, pallet homes uh, uh, to um, make space for individuals participating in the program. But let me turn on to well, let me go to uh, Councilmember Sutherland first, and then Judge Day. Yes, in combination with the problem-solving homelessness courts we visited, which are really a supportive environment, a uh, homeless individual may be able to bring their dog there and, and just be encouraged, yet uh, expected to make positive changes by the judge. Uh, with that, I hope to one day have a homelessness outreach team on our police department, a group of individuals that really build relationship with those that are experiencing homelessness in the community. Uh, they know their names, there's trust issues there that, that I don't work on. But then with respect to the trespass aspect of things, it's really around safety. You know, there, are, there are some areas in which people are camping where there's fire hazards, right? 
Uh, there was recently a, a, an electrical issue, uh, potential electrocution. There are biohazard issues, right? There are ex concerns that our citizens who are walking canals express to us. So these all go hand in hand and they work together. And it's hopefully about showing a little tough love, but getting people on the right track and, and improving their lives and, and but surrounded by support. Um, Madam Chair, if I can go to David. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, uh, Mayor and Councilman Sumber for, for teeing this up. Um, the program that we're proposing, and we will be operational um, by the time that the ordinance, if it is passed, um, and it is adopted after second reading, we will be operational. There's many things that we need to have done between now and then. We're anticipating that if everything goes as calendared, um, that the program would be operational in July with the approval of council and the support of council. We're calling the program the HART program. Um, HART standing for H, housing, E, employment, A, assistance, R, recovery, and T as in team or teamwork. Um, it is a diversion program. So if somebody is charged with um, an offense that will be part of the um, target of the ordinance that Council Member Sundberg is sponsoring, um, if they're charged with an offense of trespass or anything related to that specific area where it will be targeted, they will be summoned, but then they will be diverted. It'll be a divert, diversion program into a diversion program where they will not um, appear at the court. They'll appear at an offsite location. Uh, we will, and thank you to Jessica and Emma and their teams, we, uh, collaborated to where we will hopefully be um, able to utilize um, some of the pallet shelters within the program and other partners that we've already partnered with um, to support um, our homelessness issue. Um, we've had great conversations with community partners on mental health, ready to work, um, many, many programs um, that the city is already partnering with. Um, they'll be a part of this program as well. It'll be a, a focused program for the areas that we're talking about um, that will be supported by the ordinance. Um, it'll be a 12 month program. It'll be an intense program with different stages, but again, it's a voluntary program and it's a diversion program. If they're successful, then their case will never make it uh, to court. It will be the charges will be dismissed if they're successful. If they are not successful, then they will be scheduled and be brought back to court and the case will be prosecuted. Yeah. We'll have a more detailed um, a presentation for this committee um, in May. We wanted to make sure that if this committee supports it and then full council support um, of the resolution and the ordinance, um, those are the first steps, I think, in the process of bringing this forward. But the program's built, um, at least on paper. We have community partner and partnership and support, um, and we look forward to bringing it back for this committee's um, and a more detailed presentation as to what the program will be in May. Happy to answer any questions. Oh, I just want to point that the people that are often in, in the court receiving support and help are there because of the enforcement of the law. Imagine that. Oh, um, I, I just want to say, just to, to reiterate the point, this is for low level offenses. Oh, right. I, I, I like the changes that have been made here, um, and it incents people to be proactive stakeholders in their life and participants in their own recovery. I like the fact that if they fail to comply or if they fall out of the program, then the other instance will result prosecuted. So hopefully it will incentivize people to stay with the program at least throughout the 12 months, which is the intention. It's not to be punitive, it's to help people move forward. And so I like this. Mayor, to clarify, uh, you're, we're doing 4A and 4B together. Yes. You're looking to push where I approve. I do too. All right. There you go. Well, thank you. Thank you. We will move on to item 4C, Public Safety Action Plan. Jason's not here. Is someone else taking that? Uh, I, you are still on your speaker. Okay. okay.
start off with our, um, yeah, these are uh, our vacancies and some of our, uh, some of our units here. So we just have that going. Uh, the monthly question, any thoughts or questions on that? I think this is pretty consistent. We thought we've been showing monthly on this. Can we just wait until he makes it oh, bigger? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. No. <laughs> a lot of description. So yeah. if I, I can't even get started to date, but my class is wanted bigger. Be a lot of prescription. That oh, that's good. That's good. I can't right. see that. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. this is pretty consistent yeah. um, with where we're at. We're hearing vacancies. Um, you know, across the department, and like I mentioned last month, and we do have vacancy in chief's office, which we're still maintaining. Uh, these other units have vacancies, um, including the patrol, so we're going to kind of carry some of the some of the studies um, in the chief's office. Right. Next slide. Or so our you know recruit classes. So of course um, we had the graduation on uh, uh, March the seventh. Uh, those folks will be completing the field training program on the twenty eighth of June, and uh, we had the class that started in January. So have twenty eight in that class still. We had towards the end of the year before they finished uh, field training, and we do have a lateral class um, that's currently in um, that will finish up. They'll have graduation on May sixteenth. And uh, we have a class that starts in June, and we are well under our way in terms of getting that class filled. Um, so that's looking to be another class where we'll have a um, you know, pretty full class. Um, don't have exact numbers on that yet because we're still processing people, but that's also shaping up to be a really, really strong class. Uh, some of the training uh, that we've done uh, here uh, 2024, of course, our managing bias training. Uh, that's required mandated by the consent decree. We will finish up that training for all of our officers uh, by the end of the month. Uh, there may be a few people that missed it, um, which will pick them back up in May. So we anticipate the completely uh, uh, having officers through our managing bias training uh, no later than mid May. And some statistics. Yeah. Uh, obviously very concerning. Uh, that and our homicides um, year to date because we're up quite substantially. And uh, but fortunately, so far for the month of April, we've only had one. Uh, but essentially, when you break down those 11 uh, murder uh, year to date, we do know that two of them were drug related and that four of them were, uh, it was a you know, domestic uh, violence related um, situation. Several of them we don't know. Uh, we don't know what the motives were. Know that one was a physical altercation, and we had uh, one that looks like it might have been a self defense potentially. So, and of those uh, uh, where we have the year to date non fatal shootings, juvenile victims, uh, we do have three victims, but two of those, two of those juveniles, two of those three that we're mentioning here, uh, those were self inflicted wounds. Um, so we actually have one in our non fatal shootings, one juvenile victim. I, I'm going quick for a question. If the if one um, is listed as murder, but it's believed to maybe have been self defense, how is it listed as murder? Well, it's 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 captured in our. Uh, we have to do a full investigation. Okay. Uh, once we finish the full investigation, and uh, so it's so going to be under the. Change. It yeah. could be less. Well, it's proven to be a self defense. Yes. Yeah. We, that that'll that could change, but what we have right now without the complete investigation, that okay. we have a lot to capture like that. Okay. Any other questions? But so, sorry. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Austin, I'll, 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 I'll let you speak to it. Sorry, this is not showing what I have on my sheet, but. We usually have our normal, normal metrics here. We added a link to the dashboard to see the demographics that are being served by our NOPO grantees. We also have a link to a web page that shows the success stories from our NOPO grantees. I think we have over 70 at this point. All of them are really good. And then we have a list of some of the events that we're doing this month. Like I said, my sheet looks different than this one, but um, I can definitely send an update after this. Happy to answer any questions. I have a question. So the young people that are in this program, um, how much of the family do you involved in, in this? Because I'm just getting my arms wrapped around it. So I'm trying to understand how you keep the young people in the program so they can complete it. 
Sure, yeah, the family. So when they do the custom notifications for Aurora Save, the family is also targeted for services. So a lot of times, I mean, grandparents, guardian med items, sometimes the direct parent isn't actually in the picture. Um, but when we do these custom notifications, oftentimes the parents or guardians are present when we, you know, give the spiel about the services and the things the program could do. So for, I would say, most of the participants, the family is involved. Pretty is it ongoing? Or is it a one off or do you, do you incent the parents to like stick with the child through the whole process? Because I, I find the kids being an inner city kid myself, I find that when parents are more engaged, kids are more successful and they stay on track. So is that what you're finding? You're spot on. Yeah, Mike, if you want to speak. Yeah, so the services are voluntary. You don't have to uh, participate, but we continually re-engage them as part of the strategy even if there's recidivism. Um, and we do take a family approach uh, with uh, juveniles. And even if they're just outside of that, that age, 18, 19 years old. Um, so there is continual re-engagement to the point that they do not um, uh, reciprocate. Um, and then we put them into a, an inactive status, but uh, the program is designed to have regular follow-up and the ones that are engaging in the services, um, the case manager uh, checks in with them and makes sure that the service providers are meeting their needs and they're able to make their appointments. If not, they will help them get to their appointments and things like that for support. So once they go, they go through the program, what happens after that? So, um, yeah, if we don't have, we're not far enough along with any of the families or any individuals yet, but um, we, our, our ultimate goal is um, making sure that they're no longer at risk for violence. So we will continually stay engaged with them until we get to that point to where we're collectively um, feel like they've met that standard, um, but we're, we're, it's, we're too new in the process to have any of those types of outcomes yet. Be interested to know, you know, where the, where the benchmarks, where they're hitting and what you determine as successful. I mean, the fact that they're showing up, I guess that's a success. I would deem that as a success. But if they're hitting these other benchmarks that show that they're engaged in the program, that if they're internalizing the concepts and that they're moving forward, you know, to be good citizens, um, how are you going, how are you tracking that? Even though they haven't finished yet, how are you tracking it? Yeah, and some of those things are still to be developed. Um, we're still growing as a program, adding some components or some gaps in terms of services and support and outreach partners. So all that's still coming online for a, a full, complete program. Um, so some still to be developed. Yeah, I think that's a lot. Uh, Council Member Hancock, I think a lot of those questions are questions that we need to ask our our uh, community partners. You know, yeah. our, our uh, grantees, we need to ask we need to be asking them those questions. And, and I've always believed we need to have more accountability with them. Um, so those are questions more so when, when you get in front of the folks that we're actually giving money to for these programs. So these are just the, the, so the front line. Are, yeah, the guys. Yeah. Them up. Okay, I'm just trying to get my well, head around because just, I feel like. Well, they're not the ones that just scoop them up. They, they are involved with these kids. I, I mean, they talk to these kids and stuff, but as far as like the treatment programs, you know, the accountability programs and her parental involvement, that a lot of that is with our, our yes, is with our partners. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know more about that. Thank you. I appreciate it. So unfortunately, uh, Courtney's not here um, on our crisis uh, response team, but fortunately, uh, Sergeant Graham is. Martin and Tom Graham for CRT. <laughs> Um, as you know, Courtney's not with us anymore, so that position should be posted any time so we can start getting her spot filled so we can move along. Um, we are in the process of hiring a new supervisor for AMRT, so give us a second supervisor over there for the civilian staff. So those interviews have been done. My understanding from UC Health is that uh, the position has been selected and that they're in the hiring process for that now. So we'll see. I don't know how long that's going to take for them. I'm going to guess a week or two for that. Um, Officers were fully staffed, so we're up and running operationally there. Clinicians, currently we are fully staffed. We do have one that gave notice she'll be leaving next week. So we'll be starting to hire that process after next week. So once she's gone. 
I, I don't know if they've already posted that yet or not, because that'll be coming up soon. So we're we're in a good place right now. So good news. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so um, tell me the difference between what what, what is UC Health staff in terms of CRT? All of our civilians, except for our data analyst and the um, programs manager that Courtney had are UC Health employees. So that encompasses our cl licensed clinicians, our unlicensed clinicians, and our case management staff. And we did get our third case manager up and running. He's up and running now, so he's helping people, reaching out to them, offering resources. Yeah. I don't think we have any other questions. Thank you. And our last update, uh, the outreach team, uh, Emma. Yeah, hey all, I'm a night manager of Columbus Programs. Uh, so numbers are pretty typical for what we've been seeing. Um, what I do want to highlight for our abatement is that our outreach team started going out the day before um, and targeting camps that were about to be abated, abated the next day. And we've seen that that's really helped decrease the number of people that are there at the camp during the abatements, which means we can go faster and get through stuff faster. Um, and that's especially happened at 225 and Parker. We're also seeing less people there. Again, that's been some really targeted um, abatements and outreach from going to those locations very regularly. Yeah, I think I don't drive by Parker 225 every day, but I drive by it often, a few times a week. And I I mean, I've seen a difference. Mary, you live over there. I don't know. I, I see a huge difference going on over there. It's clean. Yeah, well, your work's being noticed. So. Do you have a question about that, actually? Because I drive on to the 225 on ramp from there every day, multiple times. And I've noticed it seems like there's been a shift to folks being on that fence next to the vacant hotel instead of out in those more visible locations. <laughs> is that an area that some outreach is being targeted to? And are any abatements being done? Or are there any issues with property ownership or right of way in that area? So we're still able to take care of that area. Um, so yes, we're, we're abating it. We're outreaching it um, every week, times a week usually. Uh, typically, the team goes out, the outreach team goes out on Mondays and checks in with the folks there. And then they will also go out on Fridays usually if there's still folks that have maybe come back after the Tuesday abatements. Um, yeah, I can't speak to why they're moving over there. Um, just having a fence is helpful. What we see a lot is people like having like their tent up against a fence. It's just an extra barrier for them. So that might be why they're over there right now. Um, and Cheryl, well, one thing, uh, and, and thank our team, is uh, that we've got an agreement with the Rappo County Sheriff uh, because that area on the other side that was very problematic, that's um, up to the fence at, uh, for the Czech Creek State Park, it's actually not Aurora. We don't have jurisdiction on it. And so it, it, so they kind of congregated there until we were able to arrive at an agreement with uh, the sheriff to help us. Um, just real quick, Councilmember Sunberger is saying that they've been, maybe one of the reasons they're not visible is they've got they've moved a little further west down the bike trail. Is that do we have any jurisdiction over if they're moving? I guess that'd be farther. Into the um, like down the highway, yeah, down that. Down the west from the west from the yeah, yeah. yeah. Down in that that goes into Denver and different jurisdiction. Uh -huh. Once it gets a little further, um, there's the like RTD kind of tunnel underneath 225 yeah. that people can walk through, and we can still talk to. That's around where our jurisdiction ends. If yeah. I'm, if I'm correct, I think on that. Um, yes, we yes. Can contact with Denver. Yes, we we do talk with Denver a lot. Um, <laughs> We're we're in touch with their folks that do abatements as well. Are they going to do abatements? Uh, so we we had a meeting over the last month with all of the jurisdictions, all the people who weren't at the table with Denver. Uh, they kind of you know on their own page in terms of you know how they're addressing the homeless abatement. I'm not throwing those individuals under the table, obviously, but uh, essentially it's, they're not quite on the same page as us. We are trying to bring those guys into discussions with us in terms of uh, furthering our cause in, in terms of abatement efforts. Um, I think it's possible. I can't say definitively. I don't want to speak for those guys. So that's the reason why you see that population have been shifted to that size specifically. Well, let's give it six months. If Denver's not willing to do anything, I would like to bring forward a proposal that we put a big sign that says, Welcome to Denver, right in front of it. I mean, that's my word. Well, I'll give it six months. Denver doesn't want to come to the table. I'm bringing it. 
Anything else? Go ahead. Um, what is a, um, I know that the jurisdiction is so odd in that area, but that, I, that there's a light rail stop that's actually in the city of Aurora, just on the other end of that tunnel. Um, and I've gotten complaints, but not recently. But how is that area right now? So our RTD was, was at the table with us. They are fully on board. Uh, we are going to continue further discussions. Actually, I have Pat Shaker working with their uh, commander right now in terms of uh, broadening some of their capabilities. Uh, specifically, we have addressed and are continuing to assist those guys in terms of addressing, you know, in that particular area. The, the, the unfortunate reality is they don't necessarily have a lot of enforcement or arrest powers, you know, they're in, we kind of take that slack up for those guys. So we're trying to put something uh, together, you know, that allows them to be able to have the same capabilities as us. And uh, I think if we're, you know, on the press of making something happen as far as that goes. Okay. I'm happy either way. Welcome to Denver or you're now leaving Aurora Fair. Aside. <laughs> <laughs> Try <laughs> not. You can decide. We're not, I'll, I'll give you that. You, you know she's not playing. I'm not playing. <laughs> <laughs> and Councilmember Sunberg said we can also add for abatement concerns. Please contact. <laughs> 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 We might be on this, but miscellaneous matters for consideration. Does anybody have anything? Any department? Anybody in the room have anything? Fire. I know you will. Chief. I know you, have you always in my hands when we have most exciting stuff from you, Chief. Okay. I know you want to talk. Um, so we are coming soon to a work meeting near you to go over the foundation of our strategic plan. So we're going to capture some of the people who are really interested in city business and, and come tag on the end of some of these. So uh, Don should be coordinating with you all there just to make sure that's planned out and that, uh, that we carve out some time at the end. Um, we're super excited that we, uh, we just uh, received approval on our annual compliance report for accreditation. Uh, this is through the Commission on Fire Accreditation International. And so it covers 10 categories and 252 individual performance indicators for the department. Um, 86 of those are core competencies. And so getting that annual approval just kind of free ups our accredited status, which is, uh, which is super exciting. And then we've been working really closely with PD on um, our restraint policy, you know, one of the things from the, the uh, consent decree um, came out was was really good collaboration between the two departments to really figure out what are our roles when we encounter somebody who's combative and in crisis. And uh, and so that's getting super close and um, and it's been really great. I've been working with uh, Chief Jewel on that um, and uh, my team over there has been heavily involved as well as risk from the city. So. We'll be excited to to get that and finalized and, and start doing some training on that as well. So those are a couple of big things. Don't take my microphone away. We're at a meeting. I, I do. have to take your microphone. Yeah. You. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, if nobody else has anything. This we'll go quick. Okay. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Go ahead. Um, there was a um, board's a uh, uh, banquet uh, last Saturday night. Mm -hmm. uh, a great event. But what I loved about one thing besides all the, the awards and, and all the extraordinary work done was the fact that you had sponsors <laughs> to cover the cost of the event. And that's a message to Aurora Police Department uh, when you all do your awards and that uh, all these new so. Uh, actually, we are doing that this year. Oh, very yep, good. yep. We've already got that worked out and arranged and we will be doing that. Yep. Thank you, Mayor. All right, yeah. Really. Um, next meeting will be May 9th, right here, 9 a.m. And this meeting.